welcome back to lecture four of Deep Unsupervised Learning. Um, this week we will take a look at um, some of the remaining topics of latent variable models as well as some other applications of variational inference. And then we will talk about bitspec coding, which is um, another interpretation of variational inference, but it's also a way that allows you to actually turn variational inference into an actual compression algorithm, just like uh, what you had learned about arithmetic encoding with autoregressive models. A couple of logistics. Homework 2 will be due next Tuesday, I believe. And um, we will have more details around final project, lo the logistics of it, um, by the end of this week. Any other high level questions? Yes. Do, do you have an update for the latent variable slides that are on the website? Peter, can you help me I'll, post, I'll post them? Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Other questions? So for this lecture, we will continue to talk about latent variable models. And like by now, you're very familiar that like basically latent variable model is one way that you structure your model, and then variational inference is the predominant way that we train this kind of model. Um, and to begin this lecture, um, we'll just look at variational inference on its own, kind of. Like we look at some of the other interpretations as well as different um, applications of variational inference. So the thing about variational inference is that it's a very general tool that can be used at many places. And the machinery of applying them is actually fairly similar across a couple different settings. So we go through some of those to get you more familiar with the mechanics of variational inference. Um, and then we would um, pick up at where we left last time. That is like we have these interesting model classes that's this VAEs, and they don't seem to be as good, um, at least in terms of density modeling performance with um, flow-based model or autoregressive models. What are some ways that we can bridge the gap and make them more performant? And we will look at those in a couple um, dimensions that we'll um, look at one by one. So recap, like what is variational inference? Like in all variational inference, you have some observed variable x. So that could be your image. It could be an audio clip. It could be a video. It's basically things, the data that you actually get. And then we believe that those data are actually generated by some z, some latent unknown factor. Um, and part of the process is try to figure out what is z, and in order to um, learn this kind of model, um, we oftentimes need to learn an approximate posterior for each data point x that sort of say what, what kind of z generated this data point, observed data point x. So this is again a recap of slides from last time. Like if we have um, q of z to be if we have Q of Z to be our approximation of the true posterior um, Z given X, then we can pick a specific divergence that we minimize um, with between these two distributions. So um, the prevailing way to do it is you minimize KL divergence from the variational distributions to the true posterior distribution. So one side comment here is that um, actually KL divergence is not the only choice that's possible. And oftentimes you can pick another um, divergence that you would like to use that may be emphasizing different aspects of your data. Let's say I can minimize total variation here. I could minimize um, some other divergence here. And those usually can give rise to different meaningful variational families. But the most common choice is KL divergence. So then just to work out the math again, what does that mean? So KL divergence from distribution of Q means we withdraw Z from your approximate distribution Q. And then within that KL divergence, like if we expand the term, it's just um, log of Q of Z um, minus log of P of Z condition on um, X, which then this part can be written out by just applying base rule. Um, and then, because this is a log of a fractional 
um, this thing can be um, further expanded out. Um, so this is just, again, to reiterate the math. So this is P of Z and X basically gets expanded into this part. And P of X becomes this part. Um, and what's nice about this arithmetic is that now we have um, what's inside the expectation that that's only depend on Z. And then we have a uh, log of P of X, the marginal probability of X, that basically does not depend on Z at all. And um, it's also, again, a thing that um, the KL divergence does not control. So when you try to minimize the KL divergence, it's sufficient to only minimize um, what's in this um, expectation. And inside this expectation, everything can be um, computed in O1 time. So this is a thing that you can just generate a couple samples for and then form an empirical approximation of and then do your optimization from there. Questions so far? Cool. So that's a recap of what we um, did last time, mostly around we want to get to the true posterior, and uh, we wouldn't really be able to access that um, in a tractable way. So we come up with this variational approximation to try to approximate the true posterior. But it's still kind of like mysterious. Like, what, what is variational inference actually doing? Um, and what's next is we would walk through a simple example of like, what that can give you, uh, mostly from an important sampling perspective. Um, so, back to the fundamental. Like, what we want is we want to train a latent variable model. Um, and then the way we train it is by maximum likelihood. So, what does that mean? That means for any given x, I want to compute the marginal probability. Um, and to get the marginal probability, assuming we have discrete latent code z, then that means we have to sum over all z uh, for this probability joint. So that's like all that is trying to do ultimately. Um, but then it becomes difficult if your z has exponential number of choices. But let's say we have a very simple z. Like let's say it, it has a categorical distribution um, that takes up four different categories, one, two, four. Um, and then for a given x, like so now x is a fixed uh, value then what we can say is we can just plot um, the um, probability mass function for the joint. So the, x, the y axis here is probability of z and x, where x is given. And then what we can do is we can say, look at um, all the probabilities if you vary z. So this is for um, z equals 1 and x. This is z equals to and x, etc. Right. So now, if I want to evaluate the marginal likelihood for this specific x, how should I do it? Jonathan, how should I do this? So you add them up. Yes. So you basically just enumerate all the possible choices of z, and you add all of those property mass up, and that's your marginal. Okay. So let's. Just do the exercise. So this is pawn one, this this thing. And then at like when z equals two, this is pawn two. When z equals three, like there's nothing. And at like pawn uh, when z equals four, and that's again pawn two, so this is like pawn five. Okay, great. This is very easy. Um, and entry level statistics. Um, and really the real challenge is um, in reality the z wouldn't be as simple as that. So what I have here is I plotted a z that could take up 100 different values. Um, but oftentimes, it's going to be a lot more. Um, let's say we have even just some um, binary distributions. Um, and, but if we have hundreds of them, then that would be 2 to the 100 all possible combinations of the z. Um, and usually what happens is that um, for any given x, p of z and x, the probability joint, would only have probability mass 
concentrated in very few places. So that's an empirical observation. Like you can always construct probability distribution that does not follow that rule. Um, but let's say um, that's the case here. Then what we are going to do when we try to compute um, p of x again, what we would do here is we would do enumeration of a bunch of possible z's, but then most of them really have um, no probability mass. So what I would do here is I would have pawn one and then we plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. So basically you would enumerate a bunch of things that are zero and then you get back at pawn one. So my argument is um, in most of the VAE that we would have or in most of the meaningful latent variable model, we would run into things like this, meaning for any given x, you would only have a very picky um, distribution in the joint space. Like, can anyone give me an intuition why that would be the case? So what does a joint mean? A joint means like what is the likelihood that this particular z and this particular x happen at the same time under this probability model? And my argument is for any given x, there's only a very few number of z that would happen together with it. Peter? Let's say z corresponds to maybe uh, is there power in the image or not? Then that will be very highly correlated with x and only some z's will be compatible with the current image. Right, so like if we want the, the latent code Z to describe like some semantic things about your image, let's say whether there's a car in this image or not, then like only the tiny fraction of the natural images that have the car in them would have that Z turn on. Like otherwise, like that Z would not be present. So that's why like for any given image, like we would expect a certain picky distribution in Z that actually correspond to it. So what that implies is that in the high dimensional space, um, we don't actually need to enumerate through all the possibilities. Um, and we can in fact place emphasis on um, the possibilities of z's that are more likely um, under that x. So that's one way that you can look at um, variational inference. So when we have a variational distribution q, um, and then what we are going to do is we are just going to rewrite um, the enumeration to evaluate the, so this is, we have the marginal likelihood P of X. And then the way that you calculate that is by enumerating through all the possible Z's. And now what you do is you multiply and then also divide it by um, Q of Z. So this does not change the value at all. That's a valid thing to do. But then what that gives you is that this, um, this formula here actually just means like you sample from uh, 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 this Q distribution and then evaluate um, this ratio between um, the joint and Q of uh, Z, which is the variational distribution. So this is kind of interesting. Like why, why, does, this, why does this thing help us at all. So let's flip back to this example. Let's say my variational distribution looks like the following. Let's say my variational distribution given this thing is one if z is zero and then zero otherwise, right? So what that means is that I have a distribution that always sample this point where it has probability mass. So what that means is that now I actually don't need to do very expensive enumerations. Like it's sufficient to draw one sample for my variational distribution, and then I can know the marginal because my variational distribution tells me where the high density regions are. And that helps me to not necessarily enumerating through everything um, that is theoretically possible, but actually does not co-occur with the image X at all. So where we are, this thing is sort of like, you can say I can have this variational distribution to help me important sample um, the objective that we care about. Um, and one very interesting thing is that you realize this thing actually is very close to um, the variational lower bound. 
And in fact, like if we take the log inside the expectation by applying Jensen's inequality, then this is exactly a variation of lower bound. So what that means is that, um, so what does, what does this equation mean? This equation means if I draw a lot of samples from, if I draw a lot of samples of z from q of z, then um, if I average all of them, all of these ratios together, uh, and then take the log of that, I would get the true uh, log prop of x. But then what variation lower bound says is that I can actually move my log inside the expectation. So what does it mean to be inside the expectations? So I can just draw one sample of z, and then I evaluate this quantity, and that turned out to be a lower bound um, of the original marginal likelihood. So this is again, it's not, nothing new, um, similar to what we, exactly the same as what we saw last time, but just like we stated um, differently. Question. Yes. Can, can you draw one sample to evaluate the, not the last, last one, but the last, last, uh, to the second one? This one, like can you only draw one sample to evaluate this? Yeah. Um, like so, so what the, what the expectation means is that like if you have, if we enumerate through everything, then you get that. But like once you only have one sample, then the value that you get isn't really the expected value, right? The expected value, you either get that through a large amount of samples or you just explicitly enumerate all possibilities, right? So um, you wouldn't, so in this case, like, Think of it as having many, many samples from Z. Uh -huh. yeah. So this gives us uh, a, like an upper bound, right? Um, yeah. But since we usually care with the negative log likelihood, this is acting and then giving us a lower bound? Well, so, um, or, or the other way around, so we try to maximize likelihood, yeah. and we minimize negative likelihood. So this gives you a lower bound on the likelihood, so you can maximize that. And if you flip that around, that gives you an upper bound on negative log likelihood, and you can minimize that. Um, so that's somewhat interesting, right? So, so basically, we can see variational distribution as a way to do important sampling. Then the very natural question to ask is, um, like, like, and as we say in the variational lower bound, you're basically trying to do important sampling with only one sample, which is kind of odd in the typical important sampling way. Um, so there was this paper, um, in 2015 that look at, um, can we actually use multiple samples to uh, improve um, my variational lower bound? So it turns out the answer is yes. So to set that up, we need a couple of notations. So now instead of, so we still have our variational distribution um, Q of Z given X, but now we draw multiple samples from it instead of only drawing one sample from it, which is common in VAE literature. So now you draw multiple samples from it, and you call the i sample J sub i, okay? Um, then we define some uh, uh, notation as well. So we would call um, a W sub i, call it the importance ratio at um, the i sample. So what it is is just, P of Z uh, and X divided by Q of, Z, um, Q of Z condition on X. So this is something that we know how to evaluate pretty well, um, which is just this. Right, so each term we know how to evaluate, so that's all good. Um, then what we have is we would define a new kind of variational lower bound, let's call it L sub k, and with the k denoting how many important samples you use. So if, you, if k equals to one, then that is exactly the same as the old variational lower bound. Uh, and when you have higher number of k's, then you try to do, use more samples in your important sampling. And then the objective looks like the following. The objective is expectations, um, so this is expectation with respect to z, um, and, and then, with respect to z, and then you, inside the expectation, you take the log of the average of the ratios. Okay, so that's interesting. Let's just do a special case. Let's say k equals to one, 
then this is exactly the same as um, E of log um, Px yes. E. Right, so when we do k equals to 1, like we see that this is exactly just revolution lower bound. Right? And um, it becomes different when you have larger number of k. Let's say, um, when you have k equals 2, then that becomes somewhat different. Like you would be like, you have an expectation of log of, inside the log, you have um, divided by 2 p z1 x1 p z1, oh, sorry, q z1 x plus p z2 x q z2 x. And then you sum these two quantities together, and then you divide them by 2, and then you take the log. So that's very different operation. Now we get a sense of like what does it look like for different numbers of um, um, k important samples. Um, then what, what, what kind of statement can we make about this new objectives? So it turns out you can similarly apply um, Jensen's inequality pretty easily and say that um, you can just pull the log out and then say that this is a lower bound of this quantity. So now this quantity becomes interesting, right? So this quantity just means um, expectation of another empirical average of W. So this thing really just equals to um, W in expected value, which is um, what we saw here, which is exactly equals to um, the imp important sampled um, joint and the expect expected value of that is just the log likelihood, the marginal log likelihood. So this is pretty cool. Like what 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 we have done to the objective is saying within the log, instead of using only one ratio, we can now draw multiple samples and then average those ratio, and then I still get a low bound of the original uh, objective. So that's cool. Um, but what what more statements can we make about this? Any guess? Like what, what happened if we increase k? You have so so we, we specifically we are talking about this quantity, yeah. right? The, the L sub k. What if we have a large number of k and compare that with a small number of k? What would, what would, the, um, um, what would be the difference in the results? Like so, variance would be smaller. Yeah. So it seems like no, um, more k should end up yielding like a better approximation. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a really good intuition. So um, to rephrase, like more k should give you better approximation of the marginal log likelihood. So like we have been saying, this thing is a lower bound of the marginal likelihood. So there's some gap that exists, and more k hopefully can reduce that gap. So that turned out to be true. Um, so this is theorem one in um, this um, importance weighted autoencoder paper that basically states two uh, two different things. It's actually three different things. Like what it says is that for all k, um, it's a lower bound. Like the first thing that it says is for all k, it's a lower bound of the original objective. And then the second thing that it states is that. This is pretty interesting. It states that on average, as you increase your number of samples, you close the gap. So that means like by drawing more samples, on average, I would strictly do better than before. Um, and as our intuition would tell us, like if the ratio is bounded, then as k goes to infinity, then you get back the um, original um, marginal likelihood. Right. So this is pretty cool, right? So um, last week we talked about how the variational gap is essentially 
the gap between the approximate posterior and the true posterior. And there was this good question that was asked in the audience that is like, how do we know how big is the gap? So now we have one way to know, right? So if we could draw infinite samples, then we know the true marginal log likelihood. Then we know like what is the gap between a one sample estimate and an infinite sample estimate. And that tells us how big is the gap that like basically how bad is our variational distribution. Yes. So you're saying that this gap is the same as the gap between the approximate and the So so when 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 k equals to one, you would you would get the following facts. So when when k equals to one, the gap is exactly the KL divergence between your approximate posterior and your true posterior. And what this is saying is by allowing k to go to infinity, like uh, by allowing k to go to infinity, this thing approaches the true marginal. So I mean of course like in practice we wouldn't be able to draw infinite samples, but we can draw a large number of them just to evaluate how bad is our model. Then we can just draw a large number of samples, subtract that by um, the one sample estimate, and that would give me um, that would give me this KL divergence. All right. So this is cool um, because now I have a way to evaluate how is my posterior. Like maybe you say I should give more layers of inverse autoregressive flow. To, oh, this is skipping ahead. Anyway, so now you can try to have a more expressive parameterization of your uh, approximate posterior because you know that it's not fitting the true post distribution. So that's coolness one. And then the other cool factor is like, this is just like observation number two is also just a very cool statement to be able to make. Like is, as you get more samples, you strictly approach your um, desired uh, objective. So any more questions on that before we dive into seeing why this is true? Um, can, can, can we go, go to the previous slides? It, it doesn't make sense if you make the log into the WI, uh, the switch the log as a reduced uh, sum, uh, the mean of that K, the first. Oh, so the, is it the question like, can we make the log inside yeah, yeah. the sum? So if you make the log inside the sum, then it's exactly the same as variational lower bound. Okay, yeah. Right, because like, this is just saying empirically how you average among k samples. So like, if you take log inside, then it's no different from just drawing z from your approximate distribution. Oh, so this, this one so yes, that's, that's the statement. So as you, when k equals to one, this is exactly variational lower bound. When k is higher, you get something that blends in between variational lower bound and the true marginal likelihood. And, and, the, and the statement here is, as you draw more samples, you, you would not be worse off. And as, you, as k goes to infinity, um, you would recover the true marginal likelihood, yes. So uh, as we get more and more samples, and as we average more, the variance goes down, right? Yeah, so, so this, is, this statement is about expected value. So it's also true that the variance also goes down, but this, this statement is, is centered around the expected value of, um, of that. So my, my question is more like, uh, at what point is it like, enough to drop? Like, for example, do I want to drop 10 million samples? Yeah. So, <laughs> In practice, you don't really know. Like, <laughs> you kind of draw it to the point where you are computationally able to afford. Um, and, and you also see diminishing return as you get like, a huge amount of samples. Then you see that it's actually not improving the objective that much. Then you know maybe this is a sweet spot that I can choose. Yeah. But like, even to evaluate the KL divergence, we still need to draw samples. Right, so to, in order to evaluate the KL divergence, we need to draw a lot of samples, and that gives us something that's hopefully close to the true marginal. And then I also have my variational lower bound, and then the, 
the gap between these two is my is how bad my approximate posterior is. I see. Yeah. Is there any statement on like LK plus two minus LK plus one compared to LK plus one minus LK as K is large? Just so if it's a field like this or not. So all we can say is that um, as K increases um, the gap would not widen, but the, I don't think we can make statements about it can strictly make progress. Not even for like sufficiently large K, like beyond sufficiently I think, I think sufficiently large K, that's what you get the um, observation three, that is for sufficiently, like when it goes to infinity, you recover the true um, objective, but not, like we don't, we, we, there's not that much we can say when it's in between. Like, but again, like within more restricted classes of models, then you can probably make more meaningful characterizations. So like the results that we see here are fairly general. So it makes very little assumptions about what is the model, what does the latent code look like, and what is your approximate distribution. So if you can characterize those more, you can probably make a uh, more precise characterization of like what's the growth rate of how, how fast I can recover that, um, but not in this general sense. Like you can. Like I can construct like arbitrarily bad distribution that it just takes forever to only get one meaningful <coughs> sample. Cool. So this is a really interesting result. So let's see how how is it actually proven. So what we would look at here is um, we would look at how do we prove statement num observation number two. That is, as you get more number of samples. Um, you want to prove that you either get closer to the um, true marginal probability or you stay the same, but you would never uh, widen the gap. Um, so notations, um, a couple of change. So this is taken straight from the paper, so there's some notation difference. In that case, they call um, the latent code H as opposed to Z. But just read this as this is an expectation over KZs. So you draw this uh, bunch of Zs from your approximate distribution Q. And um, the first line is just expanding the definition. So this is our definition of um, L sub K, the, um, the importance weighted uh, variation lower bound with K important samples. So what you get is you get log of um, K empirical mean um, of the importance ratios. Okay. Um, so next, what we, um, some, another, some additional notation change here. So what we would do here is we would say, um, we would pick M samples from H1 to HK. So what it means is that like in the outside expectation, we have chosen KZs. Oh, or KH. So this is K distinct values of latent code. Um, and then inside the expectation, we are evaluating this log of empirical mean. Um, so what we are going to do is we are simply going to rewrite this into another expectation. So the intuition that we are going to use here is that um, this value um, would be the same as the expected value of any subset of the edge, right? So let's say, what are some possibilities here? So let's say m equals to one. So what that means is that, um, so when, when m equals to one, what this means is that I would sample um, I would sample an h prime out of h one to hk. 
and then in it I would evaluate this um, So, uh, let's see. So the quantity that's highlighted in orange is the same as this one, right? So why why is that true? Now you have um, k concrete values, and the empirical mean of that k concrete value is just the same as if I just pick one value out of this k but I repeat that process many, many times. And these two would be the same. So basically M here means I draw M subsamples from this K value, and then I evaluate the expectation under that. Yes? Uh, and that's without replacement? Or that's with, that's with replacement? Uh, with replacement. So like you, you continue to draw like you're never exhausted. OK. Yeah. So that, so these, like it's more of an, more inefficient way to represent it, in a sense. Like, because you know all your samples there, you could just average them. But like, you can say, I don't like averaging all the values. I, I, I would prefer to draw one sample from it at a time, and then like, I average all the samples that I get. And they should be the same thing. Right. So I guess it's kind of obvious from m equals to one case. And it's also true for arbitrary number of m that is um, less than um, or equal to k. So you can draw arbitrary subset from this finite um, um, finite k number of h, and then the expect, um, analytical expectation of that is the same as if you just average them directly. Okay, so that's how we go from, um, that's how we go from step one to step two. And then go from step, step two to, um, Step three, this is again Jensen's inequality. This is, again, you say, oh, now what I have is uh, a log that is outside of an expectation. Then what I can do is I can move this log inside the expectation, and um, the formal value becomes um, an upper bound of the latter value. So that's interesting. So what we have inside is something that looks very familiar. This is, again, another importance weighted variation of lower bound objective. Um, but what's interesting is that now um, you are only taking empirical sum of m values. And m is, again, an arbitrary number of subsets um, of k. So we can take m to be k minus 1. Um, then in that case, is what we recognize is that um, what the two iterative expectation says is, I would oversample, like I would sample k values, and then I would just throw out some of it, just not use them. And that would be basically the same as um, I just sample m values directly. So this is what the last step does. It's just recognizing that all this is doing is just throwing away um, k minus m samples. OK, so last, we would end up with uh, um, a statement that's like this. So basically, for m smaller than or equals to k, um, L of m would be a lower bound of L of k. So that proves the um, um, observation two in the previous slide, which is as you use more samples, you, would, you cannot get worse. You can only get better. Questions on this one? May I ask why 1 over k can uh, depend on 1 over k? Um, so this goes back to the I have, I have k values, right? So then I want to compute the mean of this k values. So one way to do it is to do it explicitly. You just say add all the values together and then divide it by k. That's your value. And then there's another way to do it that is, let's say um, I have this 
k numbers, but I cannot, I'm not allowed to enumerate them, but I can sample from them, then we can still evaluate the mean. We can just draw one sample at a time and then average the samples that we get. And they, these two represent the same value. Yes? And the point of this is just saying like, uh, since LK plus one greater than LK, we just like artificially inflate K to M using this, which we're allowed to do using this process because of this. So what this means is that like if we draw k samples and then we throw away some of it, um, then what you get is a lower bound with if you use all k samples. Okay. Yeah. And what that tells you is, is that as you increase the number of samples you use, like you will not get worse off. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so that's 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 the whole point of this. M is smaller than k. Right. Yeah. M M M needs to be a subset of okay. of k. Well, yes, <laughs> of that K components, yeah. All right, so that's an important sampling view of uh, variational inference. Like we know that um, variational distribution can be thought of as a way to sample the high density region um, in the um, lock joint. And um, we also learned that how you can start to approach the true marginal uh, likelihood even if you only have an imperfect approximation of the true posterior. So what we're going to look at next, um, let's see. So actually I would, I would skip a couple of sections in the interest of time and we'll come back to it if we have time. Okay, so now we are going to look at improving VAEs. So um, where we are last time is we saw this VAE, we saw this reparameterization trick, we saw this variational lower bound. Uh, all is a cool way to allow me to learn a deep generative model that has a certain latent structure in it. Um, but what we also saw last time was that at least when this kind of model was initially proposed, the performance was not that great. Um, and there has been a lot of, lot of process, um, a lot of progress has been made in the last couple of years to address that gap, make it more powerful, um, and just generally make this model class better. So what we will look at next is fairly similar to all other content in the class, uh, all very new. So some of those might get a little bit disorganized, like we will try to give you as much of the principle behind it and some references to latest papers, but like you might not get as clean a story um, as before. So what we will look at first is um, what we can call reducing the variational gap. So as again, like how we talk about in the important sampling view, um, there's a gap in your variational lower bound. And if that gap cannot be reduced, then that means like no matter how you optimize, like you might, your gradient might not contribute that much to the marginal likelihood that you actually try to maximize. Um, so to restate the gap, the gap, what we mean here is exactly the mismatch between your proximal posterior and the true posterior, usually measured by just to spell it out, usually measured by um, KL divergence from um, your approximate posterior to the true posterior. And there are a couple ways that we can use to make this gap smaller. Um, and um, one way is um, we can do important sampling, um, like what we look at in the past couple slides, it's like you draw more samples and then as you draw enough samples, at some point it would, um, it would reach that the gap would not exist. And then there's some other ways, like we can have, um, if we look at this um, expression, we can say maybe the problem is in Q, maybe our variational approximation is not in a expressive enough family and it wouldn't find a good enough um, solution for it. And then probably less obviously, um, in a less obvious way, you can also improve your prior distribution P of X, and that can also reduce the gap. 
Um, so we'll look at them one by one. OK, important sampling. Like, we know this very well. Um, so in the paper, importance weighted autoencoder, basically the method that they propose is now I can draw k samples to form an approximation that is closer to the true um, marginal likelihood. Then we can just train on that objective directly. Yes, John? In the previous slide, I think you meant PFC. What? PFC. Oh, yes. So, yes. That you can change, not, not P of X. Like, this is, this is the hard thing because you don't get to change this directly. All right, so in importance weighted autoencoder, what it means is that you choose k, which is um, how many number of samples you can afford to do. Uh, and then now you can train on this modified objective. Um, and we also know that when k is huge, then it's as if you're training on the, um, um, you're training on the true marginal likelihood. So does this help? So it turns out it does. Um, so what we are seeing here is um, we train a generative model on MNIST. So it's a deep generative model. Like um, the Q is parameterized by a deep network. And the decoder P of X given Z is also parameterized by a deep network. Um, and what we are trying to compare is if we use the same neural net architecture, uh, but just use different um, objective function. So we are comparing VAE, which is the traditional variation lower bound way to optimize it, versus um, importance weighted autoencoder, which is the L sub K modified objective that we have been seeing. Um, so what we see, there are two columns that are interesting to us. One column is negative log likelihood. So the lower the better. We want to maximize likelihood, minimize negative log likelihood. Um, so the lower of this one, the better. Yes. What are you talking about the negative likelihood? Uh, like, are you talking on access that you sampling a data set, or are you sampling like a unit? Yeah. So good, good question. So in fact, the notation here, like in this is a table taken from the paper, is is pretty sloppy. But basically, what it means is the following. So you get x from your data, and then you evaluate your model distribution on that data. This is the likelihood, log likelihood that we are talking about. So basically, you draw samples from your validation set, and then you evaluate your model's prescribed likelihood on that. And of course, the funny thing here is in VAE, like we never actually get access to this. So actually, what they mean here is they're just reporting the variation lower bound here instead. So to spell it out, what they are reporting here is x drawn from data, and then z drawn from the variational distribution. And then they just evaluate the um, variation lower bound on this thing. All right, so this is exactly what this column is trying to report. So, so, with, so like, this is this is just the variational lower bound. So like basically they're reporting the lower bound on log likelihood. Well, well, I guess this is negative. So basically they're reporting a lower bound on log likelihood or upper bound on negative log likelihood. So the number that we see here, like the actual model performance could be better than this, but we don't know because they only reported a bound on the actual model performance, yes? Oh, uh, yes. Um, so, okay, so that's interesting. So there are a couple of choices here. So um, to walk through the, the, the table. So there are a couple of choices of different numbers of Ks. So you can draw different, um, for each data point X, I can draw k different samples of z. Why is this also meaningful for VAE? 
uh, if you look at the objectives in VAE that they're evaluating, you can also draw multiple samples of Z. And that would reduce the variance of your optimization. But it actually does not improve the bound. So this is what we are seeing. So what we can see is that as you increase the number of Z, um, I, I, as you increase K, meaning increase the samples of, increase the number of samples of Z, um, the VAE objectives gets better, right? So lower is better in this case. Um, and what that means is that you get more stable optimization. So um, as we saw last time, uh, part of the problem with this kind of expectation optimization is that if you use um, likelihood ratio a policy gradient to solve them, you would get large variance. And in fact, if you use policy gradient, you probably use, need to use much larger k here. Um, but because this, is, this uses reparameterization trick, you can see that even when you use single number of k, you get pretty good performance. Um, but as you increase it, you decrease the variance in your gradient, and it will allow it to do slightly better. Um, so this is really LK. Um, and what do we have on the importance weighted autoencoder case? So if we look at the first column, why, why are these numbers exactly the same? Right, so, right, yes. So when k is equal to one, like these two are the same objectives. So they should behave in the same way. Um, and what's probably more interesting is um, how does it evolve, right? So what we can see is that the gap between uh, on the right side is like 0 0.3, 0 0.1, Whereas on the left side, it's really big jumps. Like this is jumping two nets. This is another close to one net. So what we can see is that like when you actually optimize it with more numbers of important sample, you make more progress. But one thing that that's really hard to tell is, do you actually make more progress or is it just you are showing a tighter bound because you use more important samples? So that is hard to know. At least like, if we only read from the paper, like it's hard to know that whether the generative model actually gets better or you are just able to report um, the performance of the generative model better. Yes? Can't they just like, sample or like, calculate the negative log likelihood with, with the same k? Because like, at test time, when you're trying to get this like, negative log likelihood, can you just yeah, so, so that's, that's a good question. So like in, in theory, they can train a VAE using the variation lower bound and then evaluate the performance using the importance sampled um, bound. So that's a more prevailing way to do it now, like where you train your model using however you want and then you evaluate on a large number of K. So that's the, that's the current way to do it, but at least like back then that was not the prevailing way. So that was not reported as part of this, but like, Practically speaking, they, they do help. So if you have a better approximation of the posterior, like they do tend to help um, model training as well. It's just like we cannot read that conclusion from this um, table alone. Yeah, so lower means it fits the data better. Yes. This will always be a problem with uh, the AE, like evaluating the AE based uh, like networks, right? Because you will always just have a. Right. So you always only have, you, you can always only say, my model is at least as good as this. But like, I mean, it could be perfect, but we don't know. Like, I mean, generally, the gap is not that high. And as you do important sampling, you would discover the gap relatively quickly. So in practice, it's not an issue, but in theory, yes. Like you can always be that I have a perfect model, but just due to my crappy approximate Q, like I don't actually know how good it is. Cool. Uh, I will skip the active units column and maybe come back later. Um, so this slide is interesting. So, so we had this discussion of maybe when you use larger K, you're just evaluating your model better instead of actually learning better model. And what they've shown here is that you actually learn something that is quite different. So 
what do we have here? What do we have here is that this left column is the latent space of a VAE. So what that means is that this is um, data point x1, this is data point x2, this is data point x3, this is data point x4. And what we are trying to visualize is um, the true posterior of them. So basically, we are trying to plot z given z given x1, z given x2, z given x3, z given x4. And this is a importance weighted autoencoder with k equals phi. And this is an importance weighted autoencoder with k equals 50. All right, so it's what we are seeing now clear. So you're basically, I have three models, and then I use some expensive method to actually visualize what does the true posterior look like in this two-dimensional latent space, which is relatively tractable because it's only two-dimensional. You can discretize it, you can like enumerate everything. It's not the end of the world. Um, so what we see here is pretty interesting. So what we see on the left is that the true posterior is almost always circle-like or some kind of circle that is elongated along some axis aligned dimension. So you can say this one is kind of aligned like this and this one you can see is a circle that can be stretched horizontally and this is a circle that's roughly stretched vertically and this is pretty much just a circle. Why is that the case? Like why, why does the true posterior look like this? Like because this is not, this is, again, this is not the approximate posterior. This is the, the true posterior. Why does the true posterior almost always look like circle? We assume it's Gaussian. So, so the modeling assumption here is that this is, this is some Gaussian. And then the, um, let's say, this is normal with zero mean standard dv um, diagonal um, unit covariance. And then Q of z given x, this is a another normal distribution with some neural net output mu and some neural net output sigma. Uh, call this diagonal of sigma. Right, so you have a neural net that takes in x and then output mu and sigma. So this is what the model looks like. So the prior is a Gaussian, and the approximate posterior also takes the form of a diagonal Gaussian. But like not, none of those sets, my true posterior should be a Gaussian, and especially not a axis aligned um, Gaussian. Why, why, why does that happen? Jonathan, you're smiling. Right, so, yeah, so what Jonathan said to, to paraphrase is when we minimize, well, when we maximize the variational lower bound, we are trying to maximize the marginal log likelihood, and at the same time, we are minimizing the KL divergence between the approximate posterior and the true posterior. So that actually has a two sided effect. You are not just pushing your approximate posterior to be closer to the true posterior. You're also pulling your true posterior to a form that could be expressed by your approximate posterior. So that's interesting, like because when we usually think of, at least in the classical sense of variational inference, like you're strictly only trying to do inference. But in this kind of deep general models with latent codes, the choice of your variational distribution also shapes your generative models. Like basically you would force your generative model to conform to the family of your uh, variational distribution. That's pretty interesting. And 
in the importance weighted autoencoder case, like what they say is that in order, like, um, if we use more case, then that allow us to effectively use a more expressive um, uh, version of distribution. Um, I would link some more papers along those lines in, um, in the end of the lecture, but we would not go into details of that. But essentially, there's this cool interpretation of if you use more important samples, you can basically say that you get a more expressive distribution of Q in a non-parametric way. Um, so, so what would be the expected output? More expressive approximate posterior. And as such, the true posterior can also take up more arbitrary form. So, so that is the expected output of this. So when we use larger number of k, what that means is that there are fewer restrictions on the true posterior. Because now the true posterior can take up whatever form that you want to take up. And we do, send it, and we do see that to be the case. Like if we look at um, let's say um, x1, like what we get is a, we get a Gaussian that is elongated in a non excess aligned way. So that's interesting because now that is something that you would not be able to express in a diagonal covariance um, dependency, like this with a skewed um, um, Gaussian. And this is even more interesting. Now in this one, you see two modes. Like this is definitely not something that could be represented by the Gaussian distribution. An important sampled objective can achieve that because um, it basically alleviates some of the constraint on the model to stay very close to your uh, variational approximation distribution. Um, and as you get like larger number of k's, like you get like even more exotic shapes like those. So those gives you a hint that you actually want your approximate posterior to be expressive because like, I mean, think about this. This is only two dimensional space. And I realize the projection doesn't have really good quality, but anyways. Um, but basically what that gives you a sense is that like the true posterior can be fairly complex. And if we, continue to use um, the, the assumption that my approximate posterior needs to be um, a Gaussian with diagonal covariance matrix, then there's only so uh, little things that it could um, approximate well. Any more questions before we move on? So as we were saying, like we, we really saw the problem of limited um, approximate posterior. Like it limits what your generative models can do. It pulls your generative model to conform to the limited expressiv uh, expressivity of the um, uh, variational distribution. Um, so we really, really want a more um, expressive posterior. And one way that we can think about why we need that is, well, empirically, we saw that the true posterior could be weird, complex things like this. Um, but we can also think about this problem in a first principle way. So when we have a fixed prior, let's just say it's a Gaussian distribution. Um, and um, then you can think of the posterior's job is to do basically bean packing. So I have sample image one, and I'm going to map this image one to certain space in my um, prior. Then when I say I go from that space in my prior, I know how to come back to that exact same image. So what that means is that um, um, my approximate posterior's job is to find a way to pack all the data points in your latent space. So this is somewhat only an intuition because in practice, we don't want our models to just memorize a known set of data points. We really want our models to generalize to unseen things. Um, but this would be enough to like, think of uh, why we need expressive posterior. So this is one example. So this, this comes from a real training um, example. So 
on the left, we have um, the visualization of the prior distribution. All right. So what we see here is we're just drawing samples from this isotropic Gaussian. All right. As we draw samples, we, we plot it with some transparency, and then we get the map on the left, which is what you would expect to get. You would get the circles, and the, um, and the probability mass dies off very quickly when you are beyond like 2.5 standard deviation or something like that. So that's what you would expect. Um, and then what we are going to do here is we are going to have a data set that only have four data points. And then we are going to fit our VAE on this data set. And then what we are going to color is um, we are going to plot our latent distribution. So let's call this P of Z. Um, P of z given x equals a, and let's call this q of z given um, x equals b, and etc. So basically, each color code represents the latent code region of um, um, of one data point. So I, I think this is actually pretty clever. Um, so what the model finds, finds to do. So think of the constraints of the model, right? So the constraints of the model is um, my variational distribution can only output um, Gaussian with diagonal um, covariance matrix. So what, what that means is I can either stretch along x-axis or I can stretch along y-axis. But there's really nothing else that I can do. I, get, I can shrink the whole thing, I can make it bigger. And then if you think about the job that this approximate posterior needs to do, is, by, is to say, um, I have this isotropic Gaussian here, and um, I need to find four regions of space in it. And then each space needs to be parameterized by a diagonal covariance Gaussian. And this is basically the way that it finds out to do it. So it finds out that like for this one, I would have a very elongated Gaussian along uh, the vertical axis. And this one, I have a, another elongated distribution along vertical axis. And then I have another two um, distributions that have smaller standard deviation. So I find this a somewhat clever way for the model to say, pack everything and then still have, have it to look like um, an isotropic Gaussian as much as possible um, uh, in total. But you can see that like this is not very efficient, right? So, so look at like look at all the empty space that this creates, right? So because now there's a bunch of empty space that actually shouldn't exist in a um, in a true Gaussian distribution. And like, what are what are things happening here? And there are probably definitely more density here than it, you want it to be. So like you see that like basically your approximate posterior is trying to do packing, but it's not able to do a very good job at that because the only tool that it has is to do packing based on um, diagonal covariance, ga covariance Gaussian. Any questions so far? Yes. So uh, in this setting, what is uh is there an interpretation for the lengths of these axes, uh, uh, of these uh, of different axes? So for example, if I pick the orange couch in the yeah. center, uh, is there any meaning behind the fact that one of its axes is stronger than the other? There's no, no real meaning in this case. I mean, this is only four categorical data point that has like no meaning behind them. Like think of this as just one hot vector that has four dimension. So there's like no real meaning and then like the model just invented to do it this way. To say, oh, I can pack the space well if I elongate it this way. But like there's no semantic meaning whatsoever along either dimension. Okay, so that's interesting then. So what that really uh, shows us is that we want a more expressive queue 
Like that is not just circle that you can stretch in either axis aligned dimensions, um, but something that's a lot more flexible. So um, it would be great to have something on the right, right? So basically, you have a distribution um, that has this, like, I don't know how to call this shape, but a like pie or fan kind of shape. Um, that actually allows it to cover the space really well. So um, now you have one, um, each data point that takes up equal amount of space. And then like the whole thing approximates an isotropic Gaussian really, really well. So now what we can see is that like, it would really be nice to have a tool that allow us to pack the space in a, uh, uh, with much more flexible primitive. So it turns out we can actually do this. Um, and drawing on a lot of the things that we have learned uh, in the last couple of lectures. So when we think of a expressive posterior, what are some core requirements that we need that to hit, right? So we use Gaussian because it's easy, um, but there are a couple other things that uh, we want this to hit. So one thing is like, it needs to be simple to generate samples from this distribution. So what that means is that an autoregressive model would not work because like it's too inefficient, too intractable to generate samples from that distribution. And um, remember that all the variational lower bounds are evaluated on samples generated from the variational distribution. So you need to have fast sampling. And then you also have the requirements to have it be reparameterizable. So what that means is that whatever your distribution that you want to set up, it should be some uh, uh, parameterized transformation of some simple noise source. Um, and that itself can be parameterized and then you can train that. And then lastly, we want this to be expressive. Like we, we want this to be able to have flexible fan shape like this or can be multi-modal, um, a couple other characteristics. So, this is an active area of research and there are many few, uh, there are many, many works that work on um, finding what is a good way to represent that posterior. Uh, we listed some of them. We won't go into um, all of them in details. Uh, what we will specifically talk about is something that um, you have already learned, which is inverse autoaggressive flow, um, which fits this paradigm really well because what you can do is you get a model that is expressive that you can generate data from quickly and it's a reparameterized um, model so you can use reparameterization trick. And in fact, this um, graph that you see here is generated by an IF model. So if you use inverse autoaggressive flow, it can actually learn to pack the space really well. So this is just a quick recap of what is an inverse autoaggressive model. An inverse autoaggressive model, all it means is that we have some, Z is some noise source, and X is some target distribution. So confusingly, in this case, X is the Z. Like, so, so think of this as, transforming from some epsilon to z, whereas the z is in q of z given x. Okay, so now our target is to, um, to get some flexibly represented z. Um, so setting notation aside, like basically the way that you can do fast sampling is to realize that on the left side, um, all of the dimensions can be computed in parallel because now you're given a bunch of um, noise source and then based on this noise source, you can um, generate um, all the dimensions in your output space directly. So what are some specific ways to, to do this? So a specific way to do this would be, actually in the interest of time, I will skip some of the details. <laughs> 
Um, but basically, the, the rough way that is represented is the same as what we talk about in the similar to the affine flow when we cover the flow lecture. So does it work? So it does. Um, what we show here is the, um, the model performance on MNIST. And um, what we show here is we actually show you two things. We show you the variation of lower bound, which is we know is a gap away from the true marginal that is equivalent to how bad is your approximate posterior. And then what we also show you is we also show you the approximate marginal likelihood. So this is evaluated by um, this is evaluated by important sampling with like large number of samples, let's say 10k. I don't remember exactly how many was used here. So basically we show you two things here. Like we show you the lower bound of the model given its current variational distribution. And then we also show you the uh, uh, important sample results to show you like if you use a lot of samples, um, you get closer to the true marginal likelihood. Then what is that like? So what we show you, um, and then what we, we, we pay attention to is the following couple of things. So everything would be compared against a diagonal covariance uh, normal distribution, which is the, um, the basic choice. Um, and then what we would have is we would have um, inverse autoregressive flow that has increasing level of expressivity. What do you mean by that? So we would say one autoregressive flow is parameterized by a two-layer mate. Um, the mask autoregressive uh, autoencoder something that we learned in the first lecture. Um, and and then we can basically stack these flows, as we talk about in the flow le lecture. Like flow is just an invertible transformation, and then you can stack them. Uh, and what we show you here is um, what happens if we use more number of flows. So as you get more flows, you get strictly get more expressivity. Um, whether it's truly universal, we don't know, but you strictly get more expressivity. And then we show you as we use more hidden neurons in um, the made neural net. So what? So let's look at the approximate log likelihood um, on the right. So what this shows is that as we make our um, um, approximate posterior more powerful, we strictly make the generative model better. And probably even more interestingly, um, the model gap between the variational lower bound and the important sampled likelihood shrinks. So if you look at the first one, this is about three nets of difference. But if you look at the most powerful inverse autoregressive model that's used here, um, this reduces it to only 0.3 nets. So what that means is that now you know that your generative model is better. And not only that, your variational lower bound also improves. And that tells you, you actually close the gap between the approximate posterior and the true cold sphere. And of course, like you can see that there is still a gap. Like even when we use a um, eight autoregressive flows stacked together with huge hidden um, units, there's still a gap. But this, the gap is considerably smaller than before. Yes. So, so the log k is, is, is just your data or is kind of modeling that? So this is your, um, well, this is x from your data and p of your model. This is evaluating that. OK, so this is cool. Like, what this tells us is that like, we can think about ways to make our approximate posterior better. And that can actually improve model performance and it can give us tighter bound. That's great. So um, in the interest of time, we would not talk, dive too deep into this. But um, we call the bean packing analogy, like when we have a, a proximal posterior that is trying to pack a specified bean, um, then if we think about 
some of the complexity of the problem really comes from the fact that um, you have a fixed shape bean. Like when you have, say, an isotropic Gaussian as your prior distribution, you're kind of saying, yeah, I have this like circle-ish bean, and then you need to feed your data in it. Um, um, but you can say, oh, maybe the way to make things work is by changing the bean. Let's say I have this um, approximate posterior on, um, on, the, on the right. Maybe what I can do is I can change the shape of my prior to look like this. And just like I call this, oops, I call this my new prior. So that's a totally valid way to do it. Like, I mean, it's kind of weird way. Like, it's like you're saying, oh, because my approximate posterior is bad, so now we, I changed the bin shape to fit that instead. But it's a totally valid way to do it. So that's another way that you can use to um, increase the model performance. Um, and what are the core requirements there? The core requirements there now becomes different from when you choose the approximate posterior. Um, if we recall the variation of lower bound to be um, log, uh, log p x given z um, plus log p of z minus log q of z. So if we recall this, then what that means is that my prior distribution would get evaluated on arbitrary z. So whatever expressive prior that we use, it needs to be able to perform this computation efficiently for arbitrary z. So what that means is that the choice that we just use for approximate posterior inverse autoregressive flow is no longer a good choice for the prior. Because now, if you need to evaluate the log likelihood of an arbitrary z in an inverse autoregressive flow, it will be slow. So you need something that's different. And you can use autoregressive flow, um, or you can put an L real MVP on it. Um, there are really a lot of choices, but the key constraint is you want fast evaluation. So let's give some of the details. So where are we? So we have talked a lot about reducing the variational gap. Uh, and, and we also show that those can help improve performance. Um, and what we would look at next um, is, is something that's in a slightly different spirit. Like if we think of the um, reducing the variational gap, it's all about having more expressive posterior, having, having more expressive prior so that the variational inference can be performed um, more efficiently, more effectively. Um, then in the next section, what we will look at is something that's, that's quite different. Like we will say, can we reduce the requirement on variational inference? Or put it the other way, like can I reduce the amount of information that we put in Z? So this is quite a departure from what we have done before. In everything that we have done before is like, Think of the bin packing, like we would be like, for each data point, I'm going to encode all of the information about this data point in my latent space. And I'm going to recreate that data point exactly when I'm decoding it. So now it's, it's different. So it turns out that is a, that is a, uh, you can call it intended byproduct of using simple distribution for p of x given z. So oftentimes this is either a um, this is either a Gaussian distribution again with diagonal covariance matrix um, or it could be some kind of logistics distributions that again have um, independent assumptions among the, um, the, uh, the dimensions in x. So most of the distributions that we use for p of x given z are relatively simple. So what that means is that they themselves alone cannot capture the variations in data. So that's why you need to use the latent code. 
to communicate all the variations and information um, in your data. So this is what it means here, like all the entropy or all the variations or information is pushed to Z. So Z needs to know everything about your data. Um, but that could be different if we have a more powerful um, um, decoder. So and to look at some of the most extreme cases, so we have been talking about maximizing um, variational lower bound. So what are we maximizing? So we are maximizing variational lower bound with respect to um, data that are drawing from some data distribution. And we know that um, the variational lower bound is upper bounded by the true marginal likelihood of your model. Um, and we also know that no matter what that is, like that thing is upper bounded by um, the true likelihood of the data distribution. Um, so this is just the negative entropy of the distribution and then nothing um, would be um, larger than that. So, so okay, so that, that sets a upper bound of how good I can optimize this. Like that's basically the global optimum of the variational lower bound when we have all expressive everything. So now for a moment, let's assume that my decoder distribution actually ignores Z completely. Okay, so that's a valid thing to say. I would just say my P of X given Z actually totally does not look at Z. So think of it as a neural net that doesn't even take Z as input. But I, I just call it this way because I can structure my model however I want it. Right. And then I can further say that my decoder distribution is very good on its own. Right. So what that means is that um, it, it's actually perfectly equals the true data distribution. Okay, so that's again a valid thing to say. Um, then let's see what happens when we try to optimize the variational lower bound with this model. So again, just to write out variational lower bound that we know very well, x drawn from data and then z drawn from your approximate posterior. And this is the variational lower bound. And then as we said, um, um, in our case, p of x given z does not depend on z at all. And then it's exactly um, the true data distribution. So it doesn't depend on z, so we can just pull it out. Right, so this becomes here. And then what we have is, oops. And then what we have here left is we have another expectation um, that's drawn from z um, that's evaluated on these two terms, like which gives you KL divergence between um, oops, which gives you negative KL divergence between Q of Z given X and P of Z. Okay, so, and then we also know that um, the first part is the maximum, like if we only look at this part, this is the global optimum of this variational lower bound. And what that means is that what's on the right, the best that it can do is to have the KL divergence set to zero. Like there's nothing better for the optimization procedure to do. So the correct thing for the optimization procedure to do here would be to set my, um, would be to set my approximate posterior to exactly the same as the prior. So what that means is now if I draw samples from my approximate posterior, it becomes exactly the same as drawing samples from my prior. So what that means is that it conveys no information about that particular data point x. So then we have this totally redundant data source z that exists, but actually doesn't do anything. So what have we shown in these slides is that if your decoder distribution is so powerful, then it could just ignore um, um, your latent code altogether, kind of defeating the purpose of having a latent code in the first place. Yes? That's exa exactly what I was about to ask. Yeah. 
the, the reason we wanted it in codes in the first place was because it was impossible to have this, right? Yeah. So, well, not always. I mean, auto regressive model we know is, like, is in theory able to represent any distribution. So, like, when you add a latent code on top of an auto regressive model, you don't get any statistical expressivity from it. And, and this is to show that if you do that, then if your, say, pixel CNN is powerful enough, then your latent code wouldn't be used. Yes, so that's next slide. Uh, so basically, what we have shown is a possibility. And then it also oftentimes happens. Because when you put information in your latent code Z, that incurs a certain penalty of um, essentially the gap in variational, in, in variational lower bound. Like basically, if you put information in Z, then you suffer some um, inefficiency because your approximate posterior is not the same as your true posterior. And this turns out to be what people observe in practice as well. Like if you put a very powerful decoder with some latent code structure, then you run into problems. Like basically people notice that the latent code is not being used at all. Like I thought this would improve my model, but no, they kind of just ignore it. So there are a couple aspects of this dimension. There was the training dynamics aspect of it, and then there was the expressivity of model aspect of it. And we'll talk about both. I promise I will be quick before we get to your piece of break. Um, so like Arvin was saying, like one way that you can do this is you can weaken your decoder. If you say, I, if I have an all-powerful decoder, then of course it should just ignore everything. Um, but what if I can weaken my model in certain way to, um, to make it work? So there are a couple of proposed ways to do this. Um, I'm not going to go into super details of them, but say in autoregressive model, I can add some dropout. So like there are some blind spots in how you can condition on your surrounding pixels or previous characters. Um, or you can have a pixel CNN that has a more limited receptive field. So instead of saying my pixel CNN can, can condition on everything, I have a pixel CNN that can only condition on a local window around me. And there are also some more recent approaches that basically say, can we force the model to at least use some of the latent code, like transmit some bits of information from there. So there are certain ways to do that. Like basically you structure your model in such a way that like it always needs to transmit something. And then since like it needs to transmit something, it turns out it would also try to use it. But all of those are basically saying, now stepping away from this all powerful, all expressive model, can we weaken it in some way so that the latent code captures some meaningful information? And there are also aspects that centers more around changing the training dynamics. So the, the crucial question here is that when we initialize the approximate posterior, it's basically garbage. Like it doesn't know anything. Like it's so far away from the true posterior. And um, um, some of the observations are um, even if you could in theory use the latent code, but because um, early in the beginning, your approximate posterior is so bad, so that the gap is so wide, that it gets penalized too much. Then in the beginning, like, it just gets set to um, zero, and then it would just never get activated again. So there are a couple ways to deal with this. Uh, one way is like, you introduce less penalty, less KL penalty in the beginning, um, or you give it certain um, information bandwidth that you can use. Um, and then more recently, this is an iClear paper this year, that basically essentially proposes to you train your approximate posteriors more, and then that can help alleviate some of the training dynamics issues. So um, we cover reducing the gap, we, we cover more flexible decoder and some posterior collapse problems. Uh, and the next would be more expressive architectures. Uh, and we'll take a piece of break here and then come back. All right, uh, second part of lecture today, we'll look at uh, coding again. <laughs>
So we'll look at something called bits back coding. It sounds pretty magical. It feels pretty magical, at least to me. Um, the, somehow the notion is that you can send bits across some channel and you can get them back and it will not cost you anything. Um, so that's what we're going to try to figure out. The main references for this lecture are listed here. A paper by Frey and Hinton, by Townsend et al, very recent. Um, actually still to be presented at iClear this year. Um, some follow-up work that Jonathan has been uh, leading with Friso here at Berkeley. And then there's a special encoding scheme, ANS, that plays a critical role in making this all work. And then there's an older Hinton and Van Camp paper that already has some of the basic ideas that we'll talk about here. So let's do a quick refresher on coding. So the idea in coding, as we covered a couple weeks ago, is you want to send across as few bits as possible while still getting a message across. And we looked at lossless coding, and we saw that the bound on how well you can do is uh, this quantity over here, the entropy. So you'd like to send log of 1 over pxi bits to send across the message xi. And we show that this is a lower bound than what's needed, uh, proven by Shannon in the 40s. Then we saw that you can get close to this, up to 1 on number of bits you need to send per symbol if you use Huffman coding, which is a constructive way of getting really close. We also saw that the plus one maybe isn't that great because if you have to send a lot of symbols and for each symbol you pay a plus one, that's still expensive. So maybe we should be grouping things and then think about how to do that. And we covered arithmetic coding as a way to make that work out. All right, so that's a quick refresher. Uh, any questions about this? Because we'll start building on this. Yes? Um, when you're saying that it's an order zero Markov model, is that essentially just to say that sequential samples are independent? That is to say that we are treating them as independent. Okay. They don't need to be in reality, but we encode them with a distribution that models them as independent. OK. okay. Key assumptions to apply what we've seen so far. Um, as soon as we have a model, P of x, that we can use to build code words. Um, for this model, Huffman coding assumes we can tractably enumerate all possible x's. So we can build that tree and see what the code word is for every possible symbol we might want to send. Arithmetic coding assumes we can assign, assign intervals to each x which still assumes that you can enumerate them, put them on a line in some sense, and then conclude for this current x, where do you land on that line and send that interval across. So generically speaking, this requires that whatever you work with has a small number of symbols you might want to send across. Otherwise, you can't tractably do this. So when will this be violated? Um, well, if x is continuous, then there will be infinitely many x's. And so then, for sure, this is violated. Um, it turns out that's easily fixable. And we'll look at that on the next slide. When x is high dimensional, um, this is also violated. Um, because then, let's say maybe x is 100 dimensional, and every dimension can take on 100 values. Now you have a 100 to the 100 possible code words that you might need to find somehow and put on a line or put in a tree. And that's not very practical. That's a challenge we're going to need to address. Um, the key observation here is that actually some high dimensional distributions are still in a good shape for us to do efficient encoding. And we'll see some examples. And then we'll leverage that to efficiently encode mixtures of such simple to encode distributions. Okay, we'll follow that in with more details soon. But the key win we're going to describe in this session is that Mixture models can be much more expressive than their individual components. And so we might be able to model a high dimensional distribution with a mixture of simpler distributions and somehow use that to still efficiently encode that overall distribution. OK, so first resolving the continuous part. A real number 
x, of course, is infinite information because we can have more and more bits coming in the description of that number. So we can't really expect to ever send the real number exactly across any line in any finite time. So we shouldn't even hope for, for doing that. We should be more realistic. And so maybe realistic is that you only need to send it up to some precision t. Once you do that, then you can discretize it, let's say in the x domain. In principle, you can do it in the cumulative distribution domain too. And once you do that, um, you get a finite set of values it can take on, and you're good to go. For example, if you had a normal distribution, you could um, split it into equal intervals, and um, you could do it this way, or you could look at the cumulative according to the normal, and then you could split it in equal intervals here, and that way you can get a finite set of code words corresponding to um, your encoding of the real numbers you encounter and want to send across. It'll be approximate, but we know that's the best we can hope for anyway. Now, there's a bit of math you can do to quantify how the continuous distribution relates to your approximation of it. Um, something called um, differential entropy we'll look at here. So let's say you have an x variable and you discretize it with some discretization level t. Then what's the entropy of the discretized version of that variable, that's this quantity over here. It's the sum of the probabilities, but probabilities of intervals now. And the probability of an interval is, let's say this interval here, this surface area here would be width of the interval times height. Height is the density. And so t times pxi is the probability mass in that interval. So that's this discretized version of x. And then log of that thing in a negative sign up front. We can now um, rewrite this. So we can have this thing here split up. Log of a product is the sum of the logs. Yes? Sorry, so is that saying that if we have like uh, x equals 0.11 and we discretize to like 0.1, then the bins between 0 0.10 and 0.19, like those are all the bins, and we're saying oh, what's the log likelihood that x is in any of those? So this here would be, let's, let's take a finite version of what's shown here. Let's imagine this distribution stops over here. Then there would be bin 1, bin 2, bin 3, bin 4, 5, 6, 7. Right. And so we would now represent a continuous x by sending across some encoding of the interval it falls into, which we can enumerate now. We can send a number from 1 through 7 right. to encode the x. Okay. So that's the assumption made in the discretized version of the distribution. This plus sign here is spurious. So log of a product sum of the logs, so we split off the log t here. Um, then if we look at this, the back part here is roughly equal to essentially integral over the entire domain um, multiplied with log t because this summation here corresponds to this. This integral for a density is 1, and so we get log t over here. The front part looks a lot like entropy but it's now a density, and so it's an integral over the entire domain of p of x times log p of x. It's called differential entropy. And so what we see is if we have a density, the entropy of the discretized version of the variable is the differential entropy, which we can compute by computing an integral, and then some extra term here, minus log t. This matches our intuition in that the smaller we make t, so the finer we discretize, the more buckets there will be, and hence the more entropy there will be to get the discretized version across. And minus log t, the smaller is t, the higher that will become. And so the higher the discretized version of the variable has uh, as entropy. What is the definition of p of xi? Definition of p of xi is one of the values in this interval. So if this is, let's say, interval um, 2 that we're looking at, so we look at p of x2, it would be maybe the average value of these values over here. Now, the way integrals work out, it doesn't really matter whether you pick the average or you pick the left side or the right side. If it's a continuous function, 
is going to come out to roughly the same thing. And in the limit, it will be the same. OK, so that resolves for us how to deal with continuous variables, which is nice because now we know that's taken care of. But we still have the other challenge, which is how to deal with high dimensional uh, variables. And as I said, we're going to rely on some high dimensional distributions being easy to encode and then build on top of that. So what are some easy ones? If x is distributed according to, to a multivariate Gaussian, where the variance is just diagonal, all one on the diagonal, then this is just independent variables. And even though x is high dimensional, we can encode one variable at a time. And so we can do this very effectively, just using the same math we saw on the previous slide. Another scenario is when x is autoregressive. So even though x is a high dimensional distribution, in an autoregressive model, as we saw in the previous, previous lecture, we encode a probability as p of x1 times x2, given x1, x3, given x1, comma, x2, and so forth. And that again reduces it to encoding one dimensional distributions anytime you want to send an extra symbol across. And we know how to do that. We covered that in one of the previous lectures. So these are the easy cases. So we know there are building blocks out there for which we can deal with high dimensional variables. The question is now, can we now deal with more complex distributions from here? And specifically mixture models. So let's say we had a mixture of Gaussians. And I'll draw it in 1D, but of course our interest will be in higher dimensional distributions. Here's a mixture of Gaussians. This is a distribution that if we now draw the envelope to this might be something like this. So the green is the mixture density. And the green is obviously not a Gaussian anymore. It's a more complex distribution. And so the hope would be that if somehow we can represent our distribution with a mixture of Gaussians, maybe we can still find an efficient encoding even in high dimensional spaces. OK, so this brings us to the key question. If P of x is a mixture model of easily encodable distributions, can we efficiently encode that mixture P of x? You might wonder, why would you end up with a mixture instead of just having a other type of distribution that's not a mixture? Well, for one, all of today and last week, we were looking at mixture distributions. Uh, variational autoencoder actually computes a continuous mixture of infinitely many components uh, when it encodes a distribution. Because the latent variable z is continuous, high dimensional, and every value it takes on results in a new, for example, Gaussian output distribution. So you have an infinite mixture there. So that's one example of where we have seen this. In general, often mixture distributions are convenient to fit to data. And so we want to see it in a general case here. A couple of reminders as we go through this. Um, illustrations on the slides will be in 1D, because that's easy to draw. And you might then think, oh, Wait, it's 1D. I can solve this in a different way. All I need to do is to kind of map out the cumulative distribution function for 1D, and I'm good to go. I can already solve this. But they're just illustrations. We're not drawing them because that's what we want to solve, just because it's easy to draw 1D. Really, we're trying to solve high dimensional versions. And we won't allow ourselves to rely on a domain of x being small, because if we can do that, we can use the existing techniques. So we want a large domain for x. And um, what I mean with large is more than you can tractably enumerate. So exponential in some kind of number that you're dealing with. Um, and high D. OK, let's see if we can handle this. As a running example, let's assume we have a finite mixture. I here, notation-wise, will index into the mixture. And x will be the continuous variable. So we had a drawing of this. So imagine back 
to the Gaussian case, x lives on the horizontal axis, the density lives on the vertical axis. And the way we fit the density is by having a mixture of a bunch of Gaussians. And this might be component i equal 1, i equal 2, i equal 3, i equal 4, and so forth. Our key assumption is that this thing, once we know which mode x belongs to, mode i, let's say, it's easy to code for. So that could be because x given i is an autoregressive model, or it could be because x given i is a univariate high dimensional Gaussian, and then we know how to code for x given i. And we know that if we have a good coding scheme, that encoding x given i will cost us log of 1 over pxi. OK, let's now think about how we can proceed in solving this problem. Here is what we have available, a good coding scheme for x given i. How can we now encode when we're just given an x and say, OK, how are you going to code up x? Any thoughts? Okay, so the suggestion there is to code up x. If it's Gaussian, we just need mean invariance. Um, that answers a slightly different question, but it's, it's, a good, it's a good question to also answer. How, how would this x given i look? If it was Gaussian, then indeed px given i would be a normal distribution with some mean mu i and some standard deviation sigma squared, let's say. Um, and the assumption is that we know how to encode against this distribution. If somebody tells you your samples come from this distribution, we can encode efficiently, achieving entropy rate. But now the question is, you get an x, just as is, and it comes from p of x, which is a mixture model. Um, that mixture model will be written up as a sum, a weighted sum of these densities. But how do you now encode x? We know from early on, probably Huffman coding won't work. AC straight up won't work either. What are some things we can do? Yes? Uh, we could encode what the i is for, for any given x. OK, yeah. So suggestion is, if maybe, maybe the way we can do is we can say, OK, encode i as step one. We find i somehow. And then we can encode x given i, which we know how to do. So that way, since we know this we can do efficiently, as long as we can send across i efficiently, we're good to go, right? And so if the number of components is very small, then definitely we're already good to go with this solution because we send a tiny bit of information to get i across, and then we very efficiently encode x given i. And this will be the foundation of the solutions we're going to build. So let's take a look at uh, one way we might want to do this. When you try to send an i across, you've got to pick one. And so maybe the one you pick is the one that's most likely given the x value that you see. So I'll call that max mode coding. It's not an official name. That's why I put it in quotes, just a way for us to refer to it. So to code x, find i that maximizes probability of i given x, so the most likely mode to have generated x. Then we send i. How much does it cost us to send i? It costs us log of 1 over pi. OK, um, you might wonder why does it cost us log of 1 over pi? Well, we need to use a distribution to code against that the other side knows about. And the other side doesn't know x yet. So the other side cannot decode against i given x. If we send i encode against i given x, they have no way of decoding it. But the prior over modes, p over i, the other side has available, because no x is needed to know that. And so we can encode against P of i. Then we can send x using the coding scheme we have for x given i, which is efficient. Is this optimal? No. Because effectively, you, we're using a different distribution, right? We're encoding with a distribution that, think about it, is not saying that x could have come from any of a set of modes that have some probability on x, but only the one that makes 
makes it, that is most likely at that point. So pictorially, what it looks like is we have, let's say, two Gaussians. The total Gaussian looks like a thing, or the total mixture model looks like this. And that's P, the real distribution. What we're coding with is Q, which is the thing that runs underneath here. So we're coding with Q, but the real distribution is P. What do we lose? The KL between P and Q. Because we know when we code with the wrong distribution, the KL is the price we pay. So when might this work well? If for every X, there's only one I that supports it well and everything else is near zero probability, then the KL between P and Q will be almost zero and this will work well. Now that's less likely to be the case in a variational autoencoder. We have infinitely many latent uh, variables that could be, uh, values the latent variable can take on. And so you'll have a lot of overlap because there's infinitely many of them generating Gaussian mixture model together. Okay, so we got, we got a way to do it, but it's not optimal just yet. Let's try something else. Any other proposals on how to do this? Let me propose something. We'll do sampling instead of picking the max. Okay? So we'll again have a mixture model to code x. We sample i from pi given x. You'll often get the one from the previous slide that maximizes it if there is one that clearly maximizes it. But we now really go against the distribution. Um, then we send i. Again, why not pi given x? Because the recipient will not have x available yet and cannot decode against i given x, can only decode against p of i. Then we send x, will cost us log one over p of x given i. And this is probably efficient, um, but probably not as efficient as using the best i we found on the previous slide because the i that's best for explaining x will probably have the highest density on x and encode it slightly more efficiently. So we probably lose a little bit here compared to the approach on the previous slide. And actually, we don't gain here. It's just as expensive to encode there. So in fact, we've lost something compared to the previous slide. But it's a good starting point for what we really want to do. So is this optimal? Yes and no. It's optimal actually if we like to send i and x because we're sending it against the actual distribution jointly between i and x. It's not optimal for what we were trying to do because we're actually sending too much. We're also sending i. And so the whole bits back thinking is, is there any way for us to, after we have sent i, to somehow earn it back and not have to pay the price for having sent i? Okay, maybe I'll pause here for a couple seconds for you to think about how you might get somehow those bits back. So, okay, question is, it says optimal, and the answer here is yes and no. The yes part of the answer is if, if we like to send both i and x, then it's optimal because the scheme generates code words following the joint distribution. But if we only want to send x, then we send too much. And that's where the no comes in. We send too much more than we needed to. Yes? Why is this better than scheme one in the case of like, even if you want to send i and x? Um, this will typically be, this on expectation will be worse than scheme one. It's my uh, thinking. And the reason I think so is because the first step is essentially as expensive as it was before, there is no difference. And the second step um, is more expensive because encoding X will be more expensive against a mode that doesn't explain it as well than it is against a mode that explains X better. Okay. So we lost so far. But it's gonna be a building block and we're gonna, we're gonna win ultimately starting from this. Okay, let's step through the key idea for uh, bits back coding. This is the same as was on the previous slide. 
bits back idea. Um, not sure why it says approximate inference. I think this should say exact. We'll have an approximate version later. Okay, the recipient decodes I, then decodes X. The recipient also knows, because we assume the probability distributions are shared, the recipient knows the conditional of I given X. Okay, now that means the recipient can actually reconstruct the random bits that were used to sample PI given X. Because when we sampled here, when we sampled in this step over here, we needed to use random bits because that's the way you get a sample. Once we know i and x, if we know the sampling procedure, we know what random bits generated this particular sample. So effectively, what we did is we did not just send i and x in some way. We actually also, we, in the process, we got those random bits across in communication. So those random bits were also sent. How many are there? Well, assuming an efficient encoding scheme is being used along the way, these random bits were, generated, were used to generate i given x, so they have log 1 over p of i given x random bits in it. And we don't have to count those, because these are random bits that the recipient can recover, but that are not part of what we're communicating. The sender could have grabbed some other random bits that they wanted to get across and ship them along with everything through this uh, method. So it's not that we're sending bits back per se in what I'm describing here, but what's happening is that the sender is sending two things. is sending X and is sending this extra source of random bits that was used to generate the samples. And so you get extra bits across in what you're doing. If we do the math here, we're gonna sub we send i against p of i, we send x against p of x given i, and then we got extra bits that we got to decode at the end that somehow came with it for free, and those we shouldn't count against what just happened, so we subtract them back out. You do a bit of math here, base rule and stuff, and you end up with log one over p of x. So that's nice, because that means it's actually optimal. So we have found a optimal way of getting x across, paying only log one over p of x. It's a little weird in some ways, because we didn't exactly just send x, we also send some bunch of random bits that the other side also received, and we're not counting that against what we sent. Um, but that's what we have now for x itself, we only needed log one over p of x. Was a question here? Uh, so, like, if we didn't have any random stuff that we also wanted to send as, like, an added bonus, then we don't get to subtract the cost, right? Because we're not only... Like, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So you're that. exactly right. We are counting on there being random bits for us available. Okay. And if we ship them across, it's not counted against our transmission of X. So the picture really looks like this. You have your data you want to encode and get across. And there's auxiliary data, some pool of random bits that if you draw from those and use them in the process and they come back out on the other side, it doesn't account against your budget. Yes? So in order for the sampling to be correct, like, don't the, like, don't, doesn't the number you sample have to be like completely random? Like, if there's some data source that you're sampling from, would that kind of like degrade your performance of sampling? Yeah, so when we say auxiliary data here, that auxiliary data has to be completely random for the math to be as we wrote it. Uh -huh. And if that data is not perfectly random, then you will not correctly sample from i given x, right. and you will have a penalty you pay because you're not doing it exactly right. And there's just some experiments at the end here that I'll show uh, looking at that. So let's assume we're fine with this auxiliary data source for now. Um, there's, that's one of the assumptions we're making, and we'll look at that in a moment. Another assumption we're making is that we can compute the posterior of i given x. That's not always easy. Think back to the variational autoencoder. That's essentially saying, I know how to compute pz given x. 
But in the entire lecture so far, we always worked with qz given x. Uh, why? Because pz given x was too expensive, intractable to get to, so we had an approximation. So let's take a look at what if we only have access to this, what happens. Okay, now we sample i from qi given x instead of pi given x. Then we send i, and we still use the prior, and then we send x with x given i. Then now we want our bits back. We now use approximate inference. So when the recipient decodes, they get i and x, but they have q, so because they have q, they can reconstruct the random bits that were used to sample i given x using q. So recover random bits by knowing qi given x. Those random bits were also sent, and we're going to not count them against our budget. They come from a separate source that we just use and help that other source get things shipped along. Let's look at the math. There is log 1 over p of i. There is log 1 over p of x given i. And then we subtract back out log 1 over qi given x. That quantity is exactly the evidence lower bound in Fresh autoencoder. So what it shows is that if you optimize your evidence lower bound in VAE, you're actually training directly against a bits back coding compression scheme. And it's the correct objective for this type of compression. And so if you look at the VAE number, the elbow number you get out, that lower bound tells you how with this scheme, how well you can encode. We also know it's a lower bound. We know that actually if you used exact distributions, not Q, but the exact P, you could do even better. But of course, we don't know how to get that. But so that number is more than just a bound. It's something we can actually achieve with this scheme. Let me pause here, see if there's any questions. Okay, so how about those random bits we'd also like to send that we need to have available somehow? Well, let's assume that we have extra information available living here. These are a bunch of bits living here. The notation in this paper, um, S corresponds to our X and Y corresponds to our I or Z if we're continuous. Let's assume we have a source available for now. What happens then is when we sample y given s, this is sampling i given x, so this is our i given x, we absorb random bits, and our stack of bits that we want to send in some sense gets less, because we'll get that across automatically by later sending y0 or i. Then we need to actually encode our symbol. This here is x given i. So we need to add bits to our source that we want to send. Then we need to still send i itself and code it with our prior. And so once we send all of this, our recipient will have i from here, then have x, and then the reason we were allowed to subtract this out over here from the stack of things we want to send is because once we have x and i and we know q i given x, we can recover this set of bits is essentially what we recover when looking at i given x once we know i and x. So we got those across automatically by sending i and x. Now, once we have done this, we can repeat this process. Let's say a second image comes in, you want to encode it. And let's assume we didn't even send anything yet. We're still kind of building up our full encoding of our multiple images. Then now we can say, okay, um, <coughs> next image comes in. We need again random bit source. Well, actually, that stretch over there are new random bits we have put on that stack that we can use for encoding the next image. 
when we do our sampling of i given x, we can use these bits. And then the question is, well, are they really purely random bits? Are they satisfying that property or not? Well, if our distributions are perfectly fit to the data, then the, the way the probabilities work out, we will have a truly random distribution that we're looking for over bits. Um, if there's a mismatch between data and how well we fit it, then it will not be exactly matching up with what we want. Okay, good question. How do we send Q and also how do we send the prior for I and how do we send the uh, generator X given I? The assumption in all these schemes, just like before we had um, autoregressive models, that ahead of time you have the time to send the distributions that you're going to use for your compression schemes. So you assume you can get across all the relevant distributions and then start encoding against them. And so the recipient has those distributions available to work with. Another thing that um, might strike you here when you look at this process is that we start with some bits, um, we put more, we remove some, then we build back up, build back up, we have a longer stack of bits. What will happen next is that we use some of these, it goes back this way, then it'll grow, goes back grow to here, goes back, and this will, process will repeat. And so this is a stack process rather than a queue process. And it turns out that the existing coding schemes we've seen are not exactly compatible in a good way with the stack encoding decoding process. So we look at bits back coding, the history, the idea was proposed in the 90s. Then it was implemented for the first time in 96, but with arithmetic coding. Arithmetic coding works with a queuing system. And so you need to break things up and you pay a bunch of overhead in the process when you use bits back coding with AC. And so the efficiency is not that great. Then in 2009, a new encoding scheme got invented. I'll say a little more about it later, ANS. And that works as a stack rather than a queue. That makes it perfectly compatible with the process we just looked at. Took 10 years, but just recently, people showed how to combine this ANS coding scheme with the bits back process I just described and show that you can achieve, in an implementation, you can achieve very close to the actual evidence lower bound in your encoding, your compression scheme. So making this practical, matching up with the elbow then some extensions to this uh, done recently. I'll, I'll talk about that later. So this is the 2019 paper. Uh, it's a really beautiful paper that looks at a lot of the things that you might have questions about when thinking about this. So this paper is the, let me underline it here. It uses a VAE model achieving compression rates superior to standard methods with only a simple VAE by using bits back coding on top of uh, VAE with ANS. You might have some questions about that and they investigate them in the paper. So what about the finite precision aspect? When you use any encoding scheme, and we know in a VAE it's continuous variables and uh, probabilities are continuous, it's never perfect powers of two and so forth or perfect like integers you end up with. So What's the effect of this? Well, you're always going to have the effect that log 1 over p will not perfectly match with a integer, but hopefully we can get close enough by using a high base in our integer arithmetic. Inefficiency in the encoding of the first data point, because we need a source of random bits to be able to start out. So when we start out encoding, that's the very first encoding. We don't have a previous one yet available to reuse and to subtract back out. So we need that initial source be some cost for that. Hopefully that amortizes well if we encode many, many things to send across. Then the VAE has continuous latent variables. Um, see next slide how to deal with that. And the need for clean bits, which we've been talking about, and also see next, next slide. So continuous latent variables. Um, well, we can discretize the distribution. 
Let's assume we discretize at a level delta z. Then the expected encoding length with bits back, we would look at the discretized probabilities, because that's the distribution we use. And it would be density times width of the interval. Density times width of the interval. The delta z's cancel out. And actually, this works out beautifully. It assumes you use the same discretization for your prior and for your encoder Q. It also assumes for this to be true that you can really put these densities here, which means your delta Z has to be relatively small. Otherwise, it's not really the density living there, but it would be something a little different. And so the price you pay if you make delta Z small enough is the KL divergence between the discrete approximation and the continuous, and it'll be very small if delta Z is small. Of course, with finite precision, you cannot use very small delta z because you need to uh, send it on a finite precision computer. But the good thing is that the distributions we fit are also fit on that finite precision computer and not fit any more precisely than what you can use to send things across. That's one thing. Then the, oh, this is animated weirdly. Um, are the bits clean? This is just a reminder of the scheme we have. There is some source of bits supposedly then you use them to sample, and then you encode the mode, and then you encode x given the mode. So, we assume we, we, assume we sample from z given x, but are we really sampling from z given x? We're only doing that if our bit source is truly random. Otherwise, we're sampling from something a little different. The bits come from compressing the previous data point. So, z was encoded with p of z, but actually came from q of z given x. And if we encode with one distribution, but it comes from a different distribution, the bits will not be truly random. But actually what matters over the long sequence that we're looking at is the marginal q of z. And if you look carefully at the bound optimized universal autoencoder, that actually includes a term that will try to make this small. It's not going to be zero at the end of your optimization. So since it's not exactly zero, it's not perfect. You don't have a perfect random bit source. But since it gets pretty small, you get a reasonably good bit source when you do this. So all these considerations in mind. Um, oh, actually, there's one more thing here. There's also the encoding of what corresponds to x given i. But for that, we use p of x given i. So we use the distribution that's actually there. So there is no approximation there. We don't have to worry about that part. So how well does it work? This is from the same paper still, uh, 2019 paper. We look at binarized MNIST and full MNIST. If you look at holdout data, test data, and evaluate your evidence lower bound, and this is measured in bits per dim. You get 0.19 bits per dim. Um, and if you actually implement bits back ANS, you get the same number, which shows that the things we were worried about might our density not be close enough to, uh, might our discrete approximation not be close enough to our actual density, might our bit source not be good enough actually not an issue here. Same for full MNIST, although there's a tiny bit of a gap there between the actual encoding efficiency achieved and what the bound is telling us if we didn't have those approximations. Then looking at a more advanced VAE, one that Peter alluded to earlier, um, variational loss of auto encoder, which is essentially the same as pixel VAE. They're roughly the same model. Um, here referenced as pixel VAE. Um, they didn't use ANS here to actually look at what they ended up with, but they were comparing what is the evidence lower bound value you achieve with more traditional encoding schemes of images and showing that indeed you can do much better than existing compression schemes. So this is the first paper showing that bits back coding is actually practical and can achieve very good compression rates. Now, you might wonder, can we do even better? 
Say it again. Um, because the authors of this paper, um, for some reason, did not have time or bandwidth or ability, I don't know, um, to implement, to re-implement Pixel VAE, and then use their Im implementation of Pixel VAE to then combine with ANS to make it all work out. Um, but it's showing that in principle, if you can make Pixel VAE compatible with ANS, this is what you would get. Can you do even better? Um, models we just, just didn't get to, and we'll get to in the next lecture, are latent variable models with multiple layers of latent variables. So not just one latent variable in the middle between encoder and decoder, but your process has latent variables in multiple stages along the way. So you'd have a prior for ZL, which generates ZL, but then you from there would generate the next layer, ZL minus one, ZL minus two, and so forth, all the way till finally you end up with X, and we have decoders going this way, uh, sorry, encoders going this way, and decoders going this way. Why might you think this could work better? Well, we know that the performance we get ties into the evidence lower bound. So if with this, our elbow is better, it means our optimal entropy rate based coding for this kind of scheme would be better, then we can do better. So if our data can be better fit with this model, we can probably code it better. The question is how can you code it when there's this many latent variables along the way rather than just one Z and one X? Well, turns out you can use the same scheme. So on the left here is bids back ANS, which is a scheme we already covered. On the right is bit swap. Key idea for bit swap, rather than encoding Z as a whole and then um, getting things back out as a whole, what you do in bit swap is you say, I'm going to, I start from X, I decode into Z1, which is my latest layer latent variable. Once I decode it into Z1, or I have Q of Z1 X, I can sample um, to get Z1. Once I have sampled Z1, I can encode X with the, the decoder to go from Z1 to X. And these are the first two steps if we just had a regular VAE. We'd have X and Z, we go from X to a sampled Z, then encode X. The next step would be to then put Z on there with a the prior for Z. But actually Z came from this whole long chain of other Z's. And so instead of encoding Z against the prior, we're now gonna actually go back and see what the previous Z was and sample the previous Z, which will help us to encode the current Z. So Z has taken the role of X in the original scheme and we keep repeating this over and over and over. That way, we never have to pay the full price, at least not early on, for the encoding against the prior. We can gradually uh, encode against better distributions than the prior till all the way in the front when finally we have to use the prior for the very first layer of Z. All right, when you do this, and these are some preliminary results, uh, Jonathan assures me that you know, these numbers will keep improving in the next few weeks. Um, if you look at bit swap, versus bits back ANS, we see that we get higher coding efficiencies, which is of course what we're looking for. Um, it, a lot of the efficiency gains come from essentially how many bits do you need initially on your stack. So we look at this, oops, we look at this picture here. This is bigger than this. That's where the gains are largely coming from, which is the amount of bits you need on your stack to get going with normal bits back ANS versus bit swap. It's a lot more bits for BB ANS. And so this picture is supposed to reflect the gains that you're getting in this process. Do you wanna add anything to that, Jonathan? Okay. <laughs> Say it again? <laughs> 
intuition, why you need less initial bits, is because all we need to do here initially is encode, um, all we need to do is sample Z1 from Q of Z1 given X, whereas in the regular encoding scheme, we need to sample Z1, then Z2, then Z3. Once you sample the, sample the entire Z, we can start encoding. But here we only need to sample one of the Z's. Once you sampled one of the Z's, we can already make progress and actually encode X against that Z, put it on the stack. Um, this whole getting bits back might still sound a little abstract, so I thought I'd give you a little example of what actually happens, how you get those bits back. Um, let's say you have a distribution, and let's do it for the discrete case, and we look at, let me put it lower, you have a distribution for your modes i, and um, in our distribution, what's going to happen is um, we're looking at qi given x. That's what we're going to uh, sample from. So we're going to sample from that. Maybe it looks something like this. Fairly peaked, because once we know x, maybe the mode is pretty clear. To sample that, what do we need to do? We need to look at the cumulative distribution function. We'll look from 0 to 1 here. We'll look at the cumulative distribution function, which jumps up here, then jumps up again here, jumps up again here, and again here to hit 1. So to sample, what we need to do is we need to sample from this 0, 1 interval. Maybe the first thing we sample is 0, which means this is the interval we could be in, which still covers two possible modes, mode 1 and 2. So we're not done. We need more than one bit to do the sampling here. Once we have our second bit, which let's say we let be a 1, then after we got 0 from our source and then 1 from our source, we land here. And this interval here fits completely into this, which means clearly after having seen 1 and 0 and 1, we know i equals 2. So we're done using bits from our bit stream. We have i encoded. On the other side, what happens is you get, you recover x, you recover i. You know we sampled from i given x. You know i equals 2. And since i equals 2, you can then say, OK, if I wanted to send something across with i equal 2, and how many bits do I need to uniquely encode that? You can go through the same generative process that we went through and realize, OK, I would have needed a 0 followed by a 1 um, to end up here. And so I know that 0, 1 must have been in that bit stream that was used to sample i given x. Let's see. Um, Let me just give you a teaser for ANS. So ANS is key for all of this to work out because without ANS, you don't have a stack-based coding decoding scheme. And so that's what made it possible to make this all work in a practical setup. Um, ANS was invented by Tarek Duda in 2000, well, in, um, I think to, around 2007. And it's actually used in many, many encoding schemes, not just bits back coding that we're talking about now. Many of the current state-of-the-art compression schemes that Google, Apple, and so forth use to send things across actually use ANS. And if you Google ANS and uh, Jerry Duda, you'll find that he actually, when he invented this, he wanted it to be open source, available for anyone to use. And you find a lot of articles about a lot of the big companies now patenting things that build on top of ANS and him kind of you know, fighting those patents to make sure that everybody can keep using it uh, and in a way that's open and free for anybody to use. 
Um, the scheme itself, I think, would take a little too long to explain today, so let's defer that to the next lecture. Okay, thank you. <laughs>